Hello there and thank you for joining us on session 37 of our MTCNA tutorials. Today we have a very interesting and simultaneously useful topic of discussion revolving around DDoS attacks. Going in turn over what a DDoS attack is, where in router OS can you stop it, and the difference between stopping such unwanted network traffic via raw rules versus using filter settings. First, let's see what a DDoS attack is according to the documentation reference on Microtech's website. Under the firewall and QoS menu, we'll refer to the firewall case studies and then go to the article on the protection against DOS and DDoS threats. According to this reference, denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks are cyber threats that aim to disrupt the normal traffic of a device or a server. They do so by overwhelming the device or its surrounding infrastructure through sending an unusually huge load of traffic, commonly referred to as traffic floods. These attacks have several types, a few of which are HTTP flood, SYN flood, and DNS amplification. A traffic flood will mainly impact the connection stable in the firewall window. As previously mentioned, any given router can handle a limited number of entries in its connection stable, and the more entries there are, the higher the CPU usage will become until the hardware can handle no more traffic and crashes. Now, if the class AP, for example, becomes the subject of a DDoS attack, a large volume of traffic will be directed toward one of the addresses assigned on the class AP. Thus, these addresses will be regarded as destination addresses and the DDoS traffic will be input traffic. Therefore, DDoS traffic will go down the path of input traffic, hitting the two stages of pre-routing and input before exiting the routing flow and entering the router's local processes. As a result, based on what we have discussed so far, in the two processes of pre-routing and input, we have one connection tracking stage, and the places where we have the means to stop input traffic are raw pre-routing before connection tracking and filter input after it. In the packet flow diagram, if we use raw pre-routing, we will stop input traffic before the routing decision, whereas if we use filter input, the traffic would be halted before exiting the routing flow toward the hardware's local processes. To simulate this DDoS attack, we have set up a router which does not have any firewall configurations in any of the filter, NAT, mangle, and raw tables. At the beginning, the CPU usage of this hardware is low. However, as more and more bots and network operators discover our unguarded and easily accessible device, more traffic flows in, and we can see that the CPU usage goes higher, even though we're not conducting any networking operations of our own. Based on experience and conventional methods of operation, we expect this traffic flood to come to us by means of three IP services, namely FTP, SSH, and Telnet, all three of which are based on the TCP or Transmission Control Protocol. Respectively, these three services use ports 21, 22, and 23. Therefore, in order to monitor the traffic flow toward our router, we will first go to the raw table and create a raw rule with the pre-routing chain and the TCP protocol for destination ports 21, 22, and 23 with the pass-through action and a relevant log prefix. Similarly, we'll refer to the filter table and create a filter rule with the input chain and the TCP protocol for the same three destination ports with the pass-through action and a suitable log prefix. Now, if we open up the log window, we can see the traffic that is being directed toward our router. And as you can see, some of the log records here are critical error messages that indicate unauthorized login attempts to our router that need particular attention. Moreover, at this initial stage, we're also receiving a couple of records showing the beginning of a gradually increasing TCP-based SIM flood, generating from an unknown IP address on port 23. After a short time, these unauthorized attempts gain some traction and start to increase. And as you can see, these attacks originate from a number of different addresses. If you want, 
you can go to whois.com slash whois and enter an IP address that is creating the traffic to find more information about the owner or provider of that address. Here, you can review useful information about the owner, their address, and much more. Also, bear in mind that most providers are obligated to provide you with a means of communication so that you can contact them and report any addresses that are being used for malicious goals over the internet. If you're using a Mac, you can go to the terminal app, input the IP address of your choice with the whois command, and find the same information on your device. By reviewing the records of these login attempts, you can see a very important pattern. Evidently, these attempts want to gain access to our device by using some of the most routine and common usernames, such as admin, user, guest, and so on. In the old days, if you kept attacking a Microtech device with the same username long enough, you had the chance of overwhelming the device and logging in. This issue has long been fully resolved. However, what we see here goes to show that you should always try to use unique and uncommon credentials. As mentioned, our device currently has no firewall security, and the only thing standing between us and the attackers are unique usernames and passwords. Anyhow, after about an hour, we also start receiving login attempts through SSH, and as this goes on, we witness sharp spikes in the device's CPU usage. And finally, after a few hours, the main SYN flood attack begins coming to us from various IP addresses on ports 22 and 23. This results in a large number of entries in our connections table that moves our CPU usage up and down as the device tries to deal with this traffic volume coming towards it. If this goes on long enough, the router will eventually crash. You can also check this traffic by taking a look at the two pass-through rules we previously created. Raw pre-routing has recorded more than 1,300,000 packets, while filter input has so far handled nearly 300 packets. Now, to manage and handle this traffic, we have two main solutions. One is to refer to the services submenu and disable the services and ports through which this traffic flood is coming. Here, we can easily disable the three FTP, SSH, and Telnet services. As soon as we disable them, we witness an almost complete halt in the amount of incoming traffic and a sharp drop in the percentage of CPU usage. Bear in mind that you can also limit such services to IP addresses of your choice instead of completely disabling them. However, as effective as this method is, it isn't suitable in all scenarios. For instance, if you have a home office or a classroom where you know you won't need these services, you can disable them to protect your network. But if you're an ISP, wireless ISP, or a data center, you cannot afford to shut these services down for the sake of your clients. As a result, it is preferable to keep these services enabled but refer to firewall configurations as the second solution. To this aim, we'll first refer to the filter table create a new rule with the input chain and the TCP protocol for the destination ports of 21, 22, and 23. The reason we create one rule for all three destination ports is that we want our device to go through as few rules as possible in order to save hardware resources. If we create a separate but identical rule for each of these destination ports, our router will have to go through each of these three rules for every single incoming packet. Therefore, it is always better to keep firewall rules down to a necessary minimum. As for the action of the rule, we choose drop and also input a relevant prefix to find it in our log records. As soon as we define this drop action as a filter rule and drag it above the pass-through action, we'll start receiving log records that show packets are being dropped in the filter input stage. What's happening here is that we're stopping the packets before they can exit the routing flow toward local router processes. However, even though we're seeing a notable decrease in CPU usage, that is not enough, and the router is still under traffic pressure. The reason is that, as mentioned before, the filter input stage comes after the connection tracking stage, 
Therefore, the traffic flood is still being registered in the connections table and the router continues to process each incoming packet here. Therefore, to create a more efficient firewall barrier, we can refer to the raw table and create a raw pre-routing rule that will operate before the connection tracking stage. To do so, we'll create a new raw rule with the pre-routing chain for the three destination ports of 21 to 23 and the drop action. Once this rule is created and brought to the top of the raw table, we'll witness a complete halt to all incoming packets of the traffic flood and a very effective drop of about 90% in the percentage of CPU usage. The reason is that we are stopping this input traffic flood before packets reach routing decision and the connection tracking stage. Moreover, by stopping the packets in raw pre-routing, we are actually keeping them from entering each of the smaller steps of pre-routing and input processes and saving hardware resources from being spent in each single step for each single packet. Okay, that's it for this session. Through what you've learned so far, you'll be able to secure your own devices and make sure your network does not fall victim to a blind DDoS attack. Stay tuned for next session when we'll be using stateful connections and firewall configurations to secure our device and protect the network beyond it. As always, shoot your questions in the comments section and give us a thumbs up if you liked our video.